time in this conversation. Help us understand more deeply what you've given to us and how you've shown yourself to us. Help us to receive you into our hearts and to pass you on to our children. We ask this to our mother as we say, Hail Mary. Lord, grace, 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 Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So last time we looked at the question of is there a God? And we saw how we can show there's a God by three different ways. First of all, through reason looking at the world around us, looking at whether the world is created. Secondly, by conscience, that that there is right and wrong. And thirdly, by the relation that God has told us, which is the most clear and most evident because we don't have to rely upon ourselves. The first two we rely upon our own thinking, we rely upon our reason. The last one we have somebody else, so we listen to We're going to look at that today, the revelation. What does this mean that God talks to us, tells us who he is, tells us who he is? One of the great moments in Zion history occurs in Exodus chapter 3 with Moses. The story of the burning bush. Moses has fled from Egypt. He is hiding in the desert from Pharaoh. And that Noah God appears to him in his burning bush. And God says, I'm going to send you to free my people and bring them back to myself. And you're going to go for them. You're going to lead my people to freedom and you're going to speak for them. And Moses is actually kind of freaked out. I think any of us would be about a period of time and say, okay, I've got a bit for you. Go and free your people. And Moses kind of by time, so who are you? And God says, God says, I am when. Yet, this is what you show for the Israelites. I am sent me to you. God spoke further to Moses. Thus shall you say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is our name, Abraham. This is my title for all generation. So God's name, real to us, is I am when. When you meet someone, what's one of the first things that you do? Hello, how are you? My name is. <laughs> and so God here, Exodus chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, is saying, here's who I am. The difference is God's name is in the title. We have nicknames, we have titles, we have things that doesn't change who we are. God's name is a description of his essence. God's name describes very being, it describes who he is and what he is. In Hebrew, here's your quick Hebrew lesson for the day. So Yahweh is I am who I am. He words these letters. What's really, really cool about this work, about, about this phrase, it only works in Hebrew, is Hebrew until the 6th century AD had no vowels. So if I were to write this phrase in English, you can read that, right? So how are you? You can figure out what it says in context and from the thing, but some of these words about themselves they just had this, you wouldn't know what that, that would mean to have had more context. When it came to scripture, they began to look at vowels and writing vowels and do it. They didn't want to change the words in scripture. They weren't going to change the actual word scripts. What they did in Hebrew was they added vowels above and around and below, kind of like this. So Hebrew has these vowels that have dotted around the dots and dash. Why does that matter? Well, in Hebrew, this word, these four letters, can be translated in any combination of the tenses. So you can actually translate this word as I am was, I was who will be, I will be who will be, I will be who was, all, all the tenses themselves. So God is describing himself as the eternal one, and this name in Hebrew actually implies eternal. The way you can't do it in any other language. 
And so there actually, you know, so there are all these big debates, and, and uh, he, among Jewish scholars, how do you actually say this word? And there are even some ancient legends. You know, if you figure out the actual the way to pronounce God's real name, you could create life. But it's uh, <laughs> obviously a myth. Um, but it's because in Hebrew, it, it, it's not the vowels. It's a beautiful thing. The name itself is describing what he is. And it's constructed in such a way where it can actually be translated into any kind of term before, during, and after. In Hebrew, actually, six tenses, but that's a whole other story. But, um, yeah, past and future are all implied in that by the destruction of the Son. Eternal. So God here is beginning a friendship. He is greeted and saying, Come to me and I'll show you who I am. Now, we live in a world and a culture that says that religion and coming to God is only a matter of personal choice. We have this idea, it's based on the truth. We have to take this truth, we can't be forced to be a friend of somebody. Right? You can't force it to be a friend, but it's not a friendship. If I come to the shop and say, you're my friend today, that's not a friendship. So God is not going to force us to be friends with him. That's true. We've taken that truth and we twist it. What we say now is, well, does it matter what you believe or how you believe? It makes no difference what you believe about God. Have we all heard the phrase or the idea, well, that is true for you, but it's true for me is different. Or your religion is good for you, I'm going to follow a different religion that that's good for me. We have this idea that religion is a matter of choice. That God is out there, there's nebulous being out there somewhere, you have to kind of grope around to find. And we're all good as long as we're kind of good people. This is true. We're told by the world that insisting that there's no other religions in power. There's no more true religion in power. You know, we're told by the world to say that everyone's supposed to be Catholic. But God wants everyone along the Catholic Church is an intolerant bigoted thing to say. Is this a bigoted thing? Is it true or not? Look at this, right? This is the whole point of this. Right? It's, it's a tempting thing to say, well, just you believe yours, well, believe my stuff. And what's happened in the Old Testament, too. You look at some of the Old Testament figures like Elijah. Um, the Hebrew people were a mix of, of all the nations were all in gods. And they would kind of follow all other gods. So they would kind of say, we don't want to offend anybody. We're not certain who's the real one. Maybe there are other gods there too. So worship Yahweh, the temple, then we'll worship the you know, Moloch over here in the garden. Or we'll worship Baal over here in the marketplace. But if, if they're okay, let's kind of cover our bases. So Elijah says to them, who's the He says, long as travel issue. The Lord is God, follow him. If Baal follow him, don't go to the game. Don't do both. Religion is not a matter of games, it's a matter of relationship, it's a matter of love and union. It's not a matter of the games. So are all of us equally good? Are all religions equally true? So, or even if you want to be more intellectual and have the people to say, well, God is beyond human description. This is true. Human language can't fit God into it. God's fit human language is true. Then they'll say, doesn't that mean our religions are equally false? Because no religion, no human language can, can totally encompass God. So let's stop there. What do you think? Can you prove that there is no religion? It doesn't matter if there's no religion. It's a matter of belief. It matters if you believe in Jesus and well, that's your religion, not my religion. I don't it's good for you. It's good for me. Is something different. There's only one truth. There's only one truth. I mean, you're, you're talking about a relationship with a person. You haven't saying these things about some kind of relationship. It makes me feel good to think of you as Bob. The fact that you call yourself Shannon, <laughs> I feel good to think of you as Bob. It doesn't really matter because that makes me feel good. It's good for me. Is something different. <laughs> How could I know? 
And so if there is a God, I said that proved it was God last time, and God is true, when God has told us who he is, then all of a sudden we can't just grow up right against. If God had left us on our own to say, figure me out, do your best guess, take a stab at it, figure me out, yeah, everything be, there would be no right or wrong, we just say, well, we did our best, and hopefully the one wasn't right. But as soon as God comes to us and says, here is who I am, I've come to you, I'm going to be friends with you, I'm going to show you who I am, to have a relationship with you. That's why I'm going to you. And my job stops being figure him out and becomes follow him and receive him. Right? If, if I meet you for the first time, I can kind of figure you out. Fine. You know, she looks like she's a teacher, she looks like she's a doctor. She looks cool. Fine. Who you tell me who you are? No, I'm actually uh, you know, at the gardener. I can't I have to figure it out anymore. I have to sit down and figure it out. And if I want to have a relationship with you and enter a real friendship with you, I have to receive what you give me and accept it that way. So the Lord has come to us. And he showed us. Most of this happens in Jesus Christ, where God becomes man and shows his agonies. This happens over time and slowly. It's because of this that the Lord has said to us. Thus said the Lord, creator of the heavens, who is God, desiring to make a very good straight and establish it, desiring to live. I am the Lord, I am Yahweh, I am one, I am Adam Wham. And there is a one. I have not spoken from high. You are not visible. I'm coming to you. I want to let be seen. I want people to know you. You know me. I have not said the sins of Jacob. Look at me in an empty ways. I promise justice. Let's hope it is right. Come and assemble, gather together, you fugitives from the Gentiles. There, without knowledge, bear with idols to pay God's account. The second problem with this kind of thinking. It doesn't really matter what you believe, you just want to follow what feels good to you, it's okay, it's all, it's, all ends are equal. The second problem, the first problem is that God's told us what The second problem with this is that it makes God something that doesn't really matter or is not real. Right? In no other realm of, of science or knowledge would we say, oh, guess what are equal to You know, if I were to come to the place that 2 plus 2 equals 4, and you know, 2 plus 7 or 5, I'd say, well, you know, math is just bigger than all of us. We're going to have to disagree and disagree and get along. You know, we would say that. You know, if we just say, well, Earth is flat, the Earth is round, the sun goes around the moon, the Earth is round. What is it? All guesses are real. There's an objective reality of truth that's important to know. And as soon as we try to say, well, it's a matter we believe, what you're saying is, this isn't important. This makes no difference. This isn't a big deal. It's irrelevant. Or this isn't real. I mean, if you want to believe that, that fairies have six wings or two wings, who cares? If you want to believe that the dwarves are four feet tall or three feet tall, this doesn't make a difference. Not really. You know, I'm not going to argue about that. And you can have your own stories. And in my tradition, they were this small, my tradition, they're that small. Right. Who cares? They're not real. When it comes to something that's real and important, the person you want to know and love, this matters very much. Right? If God is real, He's real in the real way. If I want to know Him, I have to follow Him and know Him in that way. When we say there's only one true faith, and that God wants all people to know this and to follow this, what we're saying is God loves all people and wants them to be friends with Him. If you're a friend with someone, you want them to know who you are. You're not going to come and say, well, I'm, going to tech, I'm going to trick this person over here. I'm telling them something wrong. So they let me follow. That's not French. We're not saying that people who don't, who aren't Catholic or bad are stupid. We're not saying that they're evil and going to hell, we're going to love them, God's not them. What we're saying is God wants them to know him as he is. We've been blessed enough to have received the fullness of revelation. Right? There are still mysteries in God that has been real to us. That everything God has revealed and given to us. We have that. 
and we need to deepen understanding and our knowledge of personally, we give it to us in the faith. When it comes to other religions and people in other, other, other faiths, it's important to remember that people who are doing their best to love God and serve Him are pleasing to them. If I met you for the first time and got your name wrong, would you be insulted? No. You might correct me, you might ignore it, just because it's not important to correct me on that one. Uh, I have people who I have called wrong name for like four years who have told me the right name. <laughs> you know, it's like, but first it was just that they're being polite and I got awkward to help some of the different truth. Not deliberate, because they keep the mistake. Um, but someone knows you well, like your spouse calling you by the wrong name, all of a sudden that's all. <laughs> like, whoa, wait a minute, where'd that come from? <laughs> who, who is she? <laughs> right? And so someone who makes a mistake about God, it's a mistake, the Lord, Lord isn't offended or insulted. Somebody who doesn't care, is one of the is like, well, that's a whole different answer. Then they're in trouble. Right? If I say to you, I don't care what your name is, I want to call you Bobby. We can't be close. If I make a mistake and I call you Bobby, you don't correct me, well, okay, you know, that's whatever. So what about people that live like in tribes, different parts of the world, who don't have access to yeah. the Bible and to yep. churches and what? I mean, I know God is merciful, and I'm sure. But. So the Lord will expect them basically to follow things they can know from their reason. So they can know by reason how to live matters. They can know right or wrong, murder, death, stealing, adultery, or bad things. They can know that they should love and honor God. That, those are things reason tells us. Um, and so if they're doing the best of what they know, the Lord is pleased with them. Um, now, I can come and say, you know, you know these three things, therefore you're in trouble. God is right, what they understand. And the Lord, that's what the Lord alone is the judge in regards. And it's also true that it's not simply... Sometimes we can be told things, to write things the wrong way. There's a story of the uh, Indians in Peru who uh, weren't converted. So one of the... Uh, Spanish generals went to the Pope and said, well, see, these Indians over there, they're wicked, they refuse to become Catholic, therefore they hate God, shall be enslaved and imprisoned and, and treated, and, you know, do that. And one of the Jesuits was the wait a minute, whoa, 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 yes. Yes, not becoming Catholic, but, but look what you're doing with them. You're stealing, robbing, you know, raping. Why would they convert? You know, yes, you told them the truth in one way, but all they've learned is this is a bad religion. Not going to convert because your actions are not consistent with what you're saying. Apparently, Gandhi loved reading the, the, the Gospels. And Gandhi was asked, Do you ever going to become Christian? And his response was, If I ever met a Christian, I might. Right? Because to Gandhi, all Christians would want to press his people and himself. So he loved the ideas behind it, but he never saw it without. You know, did he know? God knows. <laughs> you know, it's quite possible in reality to not. And he didn't know. Again, that's the thing only God would know. The other thing to recognize is that things can be more or less true. Right? Because there's only one truth, and God is, God is a, rea a reality of a person, um, we can be closer or further away. So a religion that believes in 1,500 gods is further away than there's one God. A religion that believes in Jesus Christ but as it's confused about him, it's close to the religion doesn't believe in Jesus Christ. And so just because they're not all the way correct, doesn't mean everything is wrong. And so talking to someone can be helpful to start with what's right, rather than all things they have wrong. Uh, you know, rather than saying, it is really about these ten things, we start with, we both agree God's good, we both agree that we can serve, we both agree that He created us and loves us. Let's start there and we can talk about other things. And then you're wrong about these five things, but then you're wrong and you go to hell. <laughs> Some, mm -hmm. um, but the fact that the Lord wants everyone to become a Catholic really is just saying God wants everyone to know him as he is and be close to him. This is the last words of the Gospel of St. Matthew. The Christ says to the apostles, Go therefore, make disciples of all nations. 
Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe all that I've commanded them. Lord, will you always stand in danger? This is God's desire. God's desire is that everyone knows sin, comes to him, loves sin, and understands who he is. This makes sense? Best of us. So. If something is true, we should believe it. If it's false, we should not. What was that? <laughs> Knowing what's what the difference is difficult, yes. But at least in principle, you start there. Right? You start with that fact and you want to know it's true. Some things it's very easy for us to know. The color of the sky, the warmth of the sun, the fact that fire is hot, doesn't take lots of study. You can teach a two-year-old that the stove is hot. Ouch, don't touch. You know. Other things take lots of stuff. You become a doctor, or physics, or anything. These take long time to study and work and effort and right. hard. Why does God come and show us who he is? God comes and reveals himself to us rather than simply saying, Guess who I am? There are a few reasons. The first reason that God, God revealed himself, why does God reveal himself? Why revelation? Why does God reveal himself? Why revelation? There we go. Why revelation? Why have I come to tell us who he is? And the first reason is that just because it's possible, Know him by reason. Doesn't make it easy. It can be hard. It can be very hard to know if you can understand who he is without mistakes. One of the great philosophers, man, the Aristotle. He was a brilliant man. He, he grew up in, in the Greeks, uh, Greek religion. Many gods, everything has a god, the door is a god, the floor is a god, the sky is a god, the mountain, everything is a god. And by reason, he figured out there's only one god, the god is the creator of all things, and that we're supposed to love God and serve him. Beautiful, they can prove this to reason. But he erred, made a mistake, because he's he flying upon his own What was his mistake? He thought that God could know that God could not love us or love us. He said, we're so much below God, we're so much less than God is. And for God to care about us would be diminishing of God. Because we're, we're like nothing. And, and so why would God care about us or love us or think about us? So he thought that was you know, undignified of God to love us. So he was pretty close, but there were mistakes. Possible, not easy. I'm not a I can't do math. Throw up a rather patient up on the board. I'm going to tell you, your guess is good as mine. I don't know. Your guess is probably better than mine. Can't do it. I, I have to trust you in telling the answer. I don't know how to math that. Um, I'm going to trust you and say, here's how you do it because you solve it. Great. It looks good to me. I'm not going to figure it out by reason. There are people who do the math problem and figure it out. There are people who, who just throw reason and thinking. Figure out calculus. Not me. So just because it's powerful thing is easy, but everybody has the time or the talent. There's always the possibility of mistakes. So God comes to us and teaches us, right? Instead of saying, you can't figure it out, whatever, don't you? Because he wants us to know him without error, without mistakes, and full. Right? There are some parts of, of, of human beings we figure out each other by observing. Right? Observing your life, observing what you're writing, just reading about you. Like, I think I figured out how pretty good. There's parts of your heart, there's parts of who you are, you have to show. 
And so, yes, I can figure out God pretty good, but looking at the world, looking at what he's done, there's parts of his heart he has to show me before I know. This is why God reveals himself to us. Yes, it's good to have the other tools to say, by reason, I can prove these things. Don't just, don't just rely upon a relation. But this is more full, more complete, and more human, because it's, it's not, God is not an equation or a problem, God is a person who we love and loves us. It's a relationship. It is a relationship. The faith comes to us. The truth, the faith, who God is, comes to us in two different forms, two different flavors. Faith meaning everything God's told us about who He is and how to follow Him. So who God is. And how to follow Him. Which we'll see later equals our own happiness or our own eternal glory. The deposit meaning the, the, the knowledge, the group that, that the faith we have, the uh, the, 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 the all the truths, the knowledge that we have, what is we have all. It comes to us in two different ways. It comes to us first of all by a tradition and by scripture. You could say word of mouth and written down. We see this in St. Paul's letter, St. Paul's letter, the Thessalonians. It says, Therefore, brothers, stand firm and hold fast to the visions you were taught, either by all statements of ours or by letter. Real quick, we are dealing with human language. Sometimes human language is acute. You know, especially over time. This is one of those works. So tradition has several different meanings. And so you'll, you'll see. A, a capital T tradition and little t tradition. Little t tradition means customs and things we do to show the faith. It's a tradition that we light candles on um, candles. Tradition we eat certain foods on certain holidays. Those are tradition with a small team. Those could change, those they're helpful, but they have to do with culture, time, and place, and, and they show us how to live the faith a way. Catholic tradition has to do with the things passed on by God. The apostles, the apostles have been taught to everybody else. The scripture themselves says that there's more that's not written down than is written down. Um, the Lord gave us a church, not first the Bible. The Bible was written down afterwards. The last book of the Bible was written about seven years after Christ died. Um, but all of it was being passed on by teaching, by word of mouth, people talking to each other. Um, it begins by preaching first. And those are, are the tradition of the capitalism. It, it's the, the whole truth given to us by word of mouth. It's how Christ taught, how Christ gave us. It was a book to read Read my, my autobiography. He came to the apostles and friends. So the word of mouth comes first, later on it's written down. Even the Old Testament is first word of mouth, then written down. The tradition is all those things passed on word of mouth, scriptures was written down. So, you, so if you look at the faith, you see, first of all, it comes to the Catholic faith, it comes from Christ. Jesus is the apostles who teach their followers. 
So the early followers of the apostles, the first two centuries, are called the church fathers. So these are the men who knew the apostles, or knew the, the people who knew the apostles directly, and so we had a lot more information. We're getting, we're getting things directly from them, we had the fullness of faith given to them, and passed on the claims. So then they explain and describe the scriptures were, and their own homilies or the writings of explanations of faith, they're expanding upon the scripture and saying, here's how you understand what's being said. Here's how you know what this means. Here's how, how we can show you what Christ is, what the apostles taught. And so we'll see that there's, there's this hierarchy of this line of this being, this passing off, where Christ passes to, to the apostles, the apostles pass to the fathers, and they pass on to us. Um, later on, we'll see the word adapt. Because by itself, the scripture can be confusing. Now, you can take any other context. You can take anywhere in the context, and you can even, what I'm saying, take the context, and have a little, all kinds of cool ideas. Um, the father hates non Catholics, and he says so. <laughs> um, but you have here, um, just like Peter himself says, Paul's heart to understand. Kind of makes me laugh, actually, here this morning with the apostles. Where Peter said this one of the betters basically says, Paul's hard to read. So that takes apart the thought of scripture alone. Yes. Yes. Because you have because then the scripture comes from this. And you only understand the scripture what it means through this. And so tradition encompasses scripture as well. But yes, absolutely. Um, you'll actually need a little cool. You actually need a third thing to understand it, and that's the magisterium. Um, so there's kind of this three-legged stool, you might say. Where you have a living voice, an unwritten word, and a teaching office that says how to understand it. Um, but this is the, the, this is the that's the authority. That's the authority, but that's the laws of the day. Yeah. Um, but see, Peter says the little brother Paul wrote to you. Speaking of these things, this part of our faith doesn't know what else. In his letters are things hard to understand. The ignorant and the unstable be stored to their own destruction. That's the reason why we need magisterium, because we want to make certain it's understood. We put another way. If you want a good football team, you have to have both a passer, quarterback, and a receiver when we catch. Right. If I was out playing the NFL and I was going to catch some ball, you have the most perfect quarterback there. I'm not going to drop ball half the time. He gets to be the right to him, I'm going to drop it. I'm not that great at being a receiver. You have the faith, perfect giver, God. If he left us by ourselves to fumble when he gave us and drop it half the time, make mistakes all the time, how would we be so we, we know we, we have this faith so we have these truths we have these realities and so he gave us that magisterium to make certain sure only we get the perfect truth we also have a receiver is not going to fumble or drop or change and so we have the magisterium to help us make certain sure that it's passed on and carried down the field carried down the ages to make certain sure these truths are kept alive and real because Otherwise, you have to build to us over and over and over again, right? And just, I don't know, keep, keep by ourselves and make mistakes. I mean, how, how many Christian denominations are there? There's over 40,000 in the United States right now. Because they lie upon the soul. And then who can say what's right and wrong? I disagree with you, but start my own church. Well, that confusion is not from Christ. Christ has given us. For it takes serve and receive the spell and know it with this true love. Questions? God reveals himself to us slowly and in space. This is a phrase from Second Vatican Council of the, the day of everything. 
the stockings and house. A piece of time. After the fall, we forgot we got it. But Adam and Eve spoke to God face to face, do I really well with original sin and confusion and you know, it's hard when you're struggling to survive to have deep theology classes. But God has abandoned us. He begins to slowly bring us back to himself. And he does so piece of time, a bit at a time, you know, through the Old Testament. The scripture, God has come along and say, okay, here's the essay of who I am, here's a catechism. God starts by giving his name. God starts by saying, I'm with you. God saying, I am your God the most. God starts by calling us to himself what was called. Because Abraham, apart from the other pagans, they say there's only one God. He calls, he calls Joseph, he calls Isaac and Jacob, and says, I'm with you always. I'm going to be with you. And so to show who he is. He begins to live with mankind. Now, he mowed Moses, he then appears in our temple. God dwells with his people. Actually, first it's the temple. And it becomes a temple later on. It becomes a permanent dwelling on earth. And then finally, after 50,000 years, God becomes man, was among us, and showed us to be his, lives with us, well with us today in this church. Why does God do this? Come to us slowly in the stages. Why not just come to us and say, okay, real talk, guys, here's who I am, here's the book, better do it. He still came and gave us the characters. I'm just like, I gave you. That's <laughs> right. Here's your book, guys. Enjoy. I'm reading it. That's right. I know. Get back to when you're done. <clears throat> right? But God, with God be, being much wiser than me, doesn't do that. Well, well, the first reason why the world does it this way is because we only get things a piece of time. You don't get things a little once. You need to get a piece of time. Mm -hmm. But the child has got to read. You don't say, okay, oh, kid, here's a book. Come back and you're finished. Start with the ABCs, and then it becomes the cat and the hat, and it becomes little you know, chapter books. And mm -hmm. it's slow, it takes time. Practice, working with them. So when it comes to faith and moves to friendship, the Lord brings us down to our level. Lord comes and says, let me first show you what I'm good. I love you. Let me talk about the Trinity. <laughs> that's, that's one piece of time. It's only on the Second thing we're doing it this way is God is blessing the world to live. By coming to us through creation and in creation and in our, our human life, God is making this place full. One of the key principles of, of being a human being is this world was made for us to work with God to bring the world to Him. And so God, by coming to us in this world, is making the world whole. And helping us to sanctify and help us know him in the world. So for example, because the Red Sea is where the Israelites were free from slavery, here the word of the Red Sea, think God's promises and goodness, God's taking care of us. The Red Sea is now a forever reminder of God's love and care for his people. This also makes time. We live in time. And so God is saying, when I come to you, I'm going to come to you and bless you where you're at. I may hold the things who you are. I may know me as you are. And finally, what it does is nice the whole human family. So ancient history is fast. Us to come to him as human beings in the family 
the human family. They come to him and build them together. To help each other live with him, to be with him, and walk with him. He want, the Sami wants us to pass on life to each other and take care of each other. It's to pass on truth and eternal life and knowledge and self to each other. To give to each other our children, our friends, our family, knowledge and life and love of God. Brief, let's look at the scriptures. Let me stop, let's go and pause there. I'm covering a lot very quickly. <laughs> no, I am. Maybe I should do this more slowly and say this. But, what are you talking about so far? Are there any questions on that so far? Who right past me? Who right past me? Yeah. Charles, I'm not forgetting? Yes, okay. chapter one. Okay, so Revelation. <laughs> well, it is one of those things where we learn by repetition. We learn anything by them over again. Um, I don't expect you, after after talking about this with me, in this hour of your discussion, I have to know everything. I've done this. But I hope that you know more and understand more and deeper. And that the next time you hear these things, those will, will, will seeds in your heart will go deep. I hope that you have the resources to go back and look at it later on and pass it on to your children, come to know it deeper. You honestly hope to know the best you teach me. That's what it's about. Um, my hope is that you'll know more than you walk into these doors. And that when we know more, you love them. That that's the goal. The Bible is an important source for coming to love. The Bible has two main parts: Old Testament. Uh, here's here's a kind of trivia for the day. The bishop's hat is called a minor. It's kind of like this. Excuse my lovely. Uh, <laughs> this is my. Hurt. You know why it has these two peaks? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Old and new one. Testament. Testament. Yeah. So he's a teaching office. Two peaks because he teaches with the Old and New Testament. And so the bishop sat as, as the main teacher of the diocese. Is he saying, "I will teach you the Old and the New"? I guess. Okay. Context goes out. <laughs> so they, next time I have a trivia and they ask you what minor means, you can tell them. To really understand the Bible, you have to recognize that it's not one book. The Bible is not one book, it's a library. It's 73 or 72 books, depending on the count that uh, some people divide up by the books or connect them. So 73 books. Collected together. Over the, and written over the course of over 1,500 years, right? And so there's different, there's different genres. Some are history, some are poetry, some are long parables, some are books of worship and praise, some are, are mostly prophecies, warning us about sin and how this Jesus Christ. And so when you can't read the Psalm the same way you read the Kings, you can't be, I mean, they're all the scriptures, all the Bible, they're all true. They're doing so in different ways. Right? When you can you hang out with your good friends, you're always the same thing every time, or talk the same thing every time. You talk to your friends in different ways, different things with them. And so God comes in different ways with the Bible. So all these different books, the wisdom books, and the Psalms, and the, the praise books, and the history, these are all true. But they approach different angles, different emphases, all different things. The points are all one of the big keys is inspiration. English words made up of little words. Big, the long made up of little words. You see the S P I R. That's going to refer to the spirit. So it's inspired. And the spirit's involved there. Inspiration. Refers to the fact that 
The Bible is written by human beings. But God wants to make certain that all is written is written is true. Well, pass and receive one. Passed on. Really teaching us what he wants to say. And so God blessed the human authors of the Bible with this gift of inspiration. So the human authors of the Bible have their own individual talents, their own individual ways of writing, their own individual ways of approaching God. If you were a Greek scholar and you compare the Greek of Matthew and Mark, you'll see a difference in their styles, a difference in the way they write. Mark is very simple. Mark he loves the word and. Is he the one who wrote all the word on sentences? Uh, he's the one who's the guy short and choppy. Um, so Luke is a lot more fluid. Um, Mark, is, Mark is the one very short, very choppy, and almost every sentence begins with the word and. <laughs> and Christ did this, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's less, it's less polish than Luke who was, who was a doctor. And so his Greek is to be more fluid. He was, he was originally from Greece. And so he spoke Greek more fluently, more poetically. Or Paul was very poetic. And he writes sentences that are not have a page long. Yeah. You know, that's, the Greek does that. We have to kind of, you know, the, the Greek language likes kind of piling on like the glare uh, Latin language likes the short thing to walk. Greek likes the glare cake. And so these, these people are coming from approaching God, writing about God, in their own talents, their own knowledge, their own, their own experience of God. But God blesses them. And make certain there are no errors or mistakes. So, no errors, no mistakes, says the truth. Does it mean they're always easy to understand? No. We right? saw that even the scripture says, careful, Paul's hard to understand. But there's no errors, there's no mistakes. And because God is the one who guides and teaches and makes service happens, God is the real author of the Bible. He uses many human authors. Matthew really wrote, it wasn't like God was written this year, and Matthew took dictation. He wasn't just a secretary for God. But when, when Matthew wrote, God guided him and helped him, so there was no errors, no mistakes, nothing wrong. And the truth is passed on. Now remember, different genres, right? So there's, there's, just because there's no errors or mistakes doesn't mean it says everything needs to be said in that particular book. Or the way we'd like it to be said. Uh, so the book of Genesis is going to approach things more in a story fashion than in a history fashion. Um, if the six-year-old comes to him and says, where did babies come from? You can answer one of three ways. You can lie to them and say, oh, the storks bring the babies and, and uh, you know, found them in the cabbage. <laughs> Don't recommend that. You can uh, give up the lesson of theology and really freak them out. <laughs> Don't recommend that either. Or you can kind of give them something that it's appropriate to their, their level of understanding that's true. You know, husband and one mom and dad love each other, God puts a baby in mom's tongue. All truth, all real, all they need to know. Don't need an order. Not a lie. Some of the books in the Bible, fully on the stages, God speaks truth. It's not, the, it's not the full truth, the complete truth, or everything we do. We would like to know now. Details are hidden, details are told, told but in ways that are told in simple ways, or told in ways of parable or short. Doesn't mean it's a lie, or it's fake, or made up, or false. It just means that the point is not what you think it is. It's the biggest, most true point of where the babies come from is love and God. Right? That's, that's, that's the bottom line. Not that theology is unimportant, but not really important at the time of that question. In the same way, when it comes to things like the creation of man and, and, and history and, and you know, the Big Bang or seven days or a thousand years, not really important. The important thing is, is God and creation, original sin, and those things. So, so some of those things 
are beyond what the Bible talks about. Not false or against, but it's different. And so, we get, often we kind of get confused because, because we try to combine these things and shove them into. Uh, so, for example, if a story were to come in your wedding, he would talk about your wedding in the way that he would talk about it. And it's not that you'd be telling tell, tell the wrong thing, you'd be telling the wrong things, but it's according to his not his story. It's the same thing to be true with some of the scriptures. So the problem is people will look at things like in a history book, and they're trying to learn history from it, not who God is. It's not that it's false, it's just that God's not going to teach us history. God's teaching, at least in Genesis, to teaching us who he is and who we are. Does that make sense? How does like the book of like Chronicles, how does that sh like show us who God is? So the, that's history. So that is where it had a history book. Right. Um, and so those are God dealing with his people. And God guiding his people to know him and oftentimes is sick. So we do the kings and those. Plus, again, it's. Some of those are hard to read. It is. This is also, it's also a tab history, right? It's a tab history. It's a tab history we're here talking about how God, in the midst of great confusion, kept the line going, kept his promises going, was faithful to his people, and they were unfaithful. The other thing to recognize is the Old Testament leads to the New Testament, which Jesus. The Old Testament, but Christ is an afterthought. Christ said, oh cool, we can come do this now. <laughs> Everything that happens, the Old Testament is God preparing the way for his son. It's God deliberately getting us ready for his son. It's all the pages of the Old Testament to help us understand Jesus is. If I were to give you a present, what I see first is going to be the gift and the box and the wrapping paper and the ribbon and card, right? What you're going to see first is the wrapping paper, is the, is the ribbon, the wrapping paper, and the box and the present. From God's point of view, Christ comes first. This is the wrapping paper to get us. This is the Preparation. From our point of view, this comes first, and then we get to the present side. But all of the Old Testament is there, where God is showing us who Christ is in simple ways to understand what He's doing. And so in the Old Testament, the Lord is preparing the way for Christ, to understand what He's doing, showing us His mission, showing us His freedom, showing us His salvation. And so if you get what happens here at human level, the simple way, we get better at what Christ is doing when he comes. So for example, for example, the Red Sea. The story of the Red Sea is history. Um, is you know, people were slaves in Egypt. Moses comes to get them free, prayer to listen. Uh, Fine, they go and they, they cross the Red Sea. Pharaoh, after the plagues, to cut it up. They cross the Red Sea, they've been traced down by the Egyptians, back in slavery. The people cross the Red Sea, the Egyptians who see the sea split and the fire of God behind them, and then, you know what, well, I'm done. Follow them anyway, and they drown in the Red Sea, and the people are free to follow God on the promised land. True story, it does mean. When we want to talk to people, explain to people something difficult and complicated, we'll tell stories, use analogies, we give examples. God uses real people. God explains what he's doing to who he is by the events. But the story of the Red Sea teaches us about baptism. See, in the Red Sea, there was a slave to a king. Before Christ came and saved us, you were slaves to the devil and to sin. By following Moses, he crossed the water and gets freed from the slave. By following Christ, we get to put into the baptism of water, we get free from sin and the power of the devil. Once we cross the Red Sea, then we can go to the promised land. We become God's people. Once we go through baptism, 
go to the promised land of eternal life in heaven, becoming God's people and God's children. The Old Testament shows us what Christ is doing. If you get this, you're going to get this in deeper way. This prepares the way for Christ's truth and Christ's work. One of the important parts of Revelation is he forms a people for us. The Israel people are supposed to teach others to follow him. Why does he form a people? Well, he wants to be a real man. But he could have had, had Christ come from nowhere, be created out of, of dirt like Adam was, or to pop out of nothing. You know, like, but he wanted to be a real human being, be born. They feel people have real language, real culture, real time, real place. What truly one of us? If he was created from something else, some other way, he wouldn't really, really, really be one of us. He wouldn't really be a human being. He wouldn't look a human being, he wouldn't really be a human being. And so he forms a people for us. The preparation is easier to understand and receive who he is when he comes. He has to understand who God is, that God is good and God is one, and understand that God is triune, and God's come to save us. This also helps to understand the church. Both Israel and the church, the place where we come into contact with God, no God comes to understand it. It's true in a deep way for the church, but it's also true that the people of Israel will test But just because there's always a big difference between the Old and Testament. Here God become man, is repairs for him. Everything is different because Christ become man. One more point here with Revelation to my research. Okay. Thanks, Dan, for letting me know. You need to get something? <laughs> There's no more revelation to happen until that. With the death of the last apostle John, revelation ends. Until we see God face to face in heaven, there's no more, nothing else to be expected. There's not going to be a third testament or a newer testament. This is it. With the death of St. John. St. John the Apostle died around the year 180, give or take. He was a young boy, he first knew Christ. Traditionally, he was 19 years old when Christ died, and he lived to be an old man before he actually passed away. God has told us everything he wants us to know. Now, we can deepen our understanding, we can grow with our personal understanding, we can expand it, we can explain it better, we can teach it better. But he's given us a thing, he's given us a son. How can he give us more if he's already given us Jesus? Give that thing. Now, we'll see face to face with that. Let me look at one example real quick. Of how the character of the New Testament. And that's the law of Moses. One more example of how the Old Testament shows us the New Testament. The law of Moses are these commands, the rituals of the Jewish law. 613 commands in the Old Testament scriptures saying how to live, how to eat, how to dress, how to get up, how to pray. The whole life is these structured commands, rituals. Too many people look at the law of Moses, the Pharisees and say, oh, those are just people being, being scrupulous, they're people being silly, they're people being dumb. It's not what's going on. Don't read it that way. What's going on is that God in the scriptures given the people basic rules of how to come to, come to him by your act, come to God by your act. So to be able to be united to God. You get up in the morning, say these prayers. You get dressed up on these clothes. And you eat, eat these things. So everything you're doing is an act of love and obedience to your God. Beautiful thing. 
However, we get a deeper gift in baptism. Because we're united to Christ and God, not simply about what we do externally. That fact of ritual is we're united to God by the blood of Christ and by union in His Son. By a new life that comes to us and dwells in us and transforms us. And so our day, our life, our it should be an act of obedience to God. The union comes not through a ritual or a or command. It comes through Christ's blood and union with him. Same idea, same meaning, but a far deeper, greater thing. God's walking among us. Secondly, this shows who belongs to God. It marks uh, who was his people? If you weren't circumcised, or if all his commands are not his people, it makes them into a society, a culture, a family. We now have this in the church. We are now God's family, God's culture, God's people. And united not through ritual or law, but we have those two. We're united now through Christ, his own person, his own love, and love. A deeper union, a deeper family, a greater society, a greater love, a greater culture. And finally, it, it shows Christ. It prophesies Christ will do. For example, there were sacrifices in the Old Testament. The sacrifice of the sheep and the goats and the blood pointed to Christ. Well, this is Christ. Christ has come. So this pro prophecy has been fulfilled, the coming of Jesus Christ. We should go back and, and, and deeper understand. That going back and seeing this promise, we can say, like, ah, here's who Christ is. Going back and looking at what was, what was Christ doing, what was God doing in the Old Testament, okay, now I'm getting better what actually happened when he came. God loves us. When God comes to us, he reveals love to us. The Father's heart. Does it make any sense? I don't want to do fast. Are we good with Christ's laws? Okay. God loves us. God comes to us to form friendship with us. What God wants from us is to let us love Him and let Him love us. And to do this, that we live with Him here on earth and eternally in heaven. And so when God comes to us, not simply saying, here's a bunch of facts about me, but that's also what's happening. There are no facts, there are no truths. So God's saying, here's my heart. And so you should know facts, right? People you love, you should know things about them. You don't say what color their eyes are, their favorite food, and things like that. You love them, you know, you should know their little facts. But that's not the important part, the important part of the person. We should know facts about our God, we should know the man, we should know the companions, we should know the battle, all the different truths of who God is. More importantly, we should know God. We should have a relationship with God, love Him, and love God. And how can we be friends with God? This is my final point before we go to class. Friendship is two people that mutually care about each other, not one side. Friendship is when we care about each other and try to look for God, help each other in various ways. It's easy to see how God is going to be friends with us. Right? We need help. We love life. We need life. We need food. We need all kinds of things. God cares for us. But how can I care for God? God is nothing from me. How can I have a friendship with God if I can't give them anything true? That's an effect of that. There's going to be more and more sense of that. And the way to be friends with God, God is not by wanting more for God, by wanting to give God things, which is impossible, but by looking at who God is and rejoicing and loving that He is great. It's not that I want things for God, that I rejoice that God is good, that God is mighty, that God is who He is. This becomes the center of my friendship for God, the center of worship, of adoration, and union with is I look at God and say, God is almighty, all powerful, all good, all loving, all true. And I rejoice in that. 
That's why I can be friends with God. That's why I can come and open the open. And that's the center of my relationship with him. That has his greatest his goodness and rejoice in loving him for being that way. Questions? They said before, I'm going to end every class of this four sheet dogmas class, unite them together so that they don't uh, stay in our point of mind. So the four sheet dogmas again the Trinity, the Incarnation, the God of the Man, the Church, and Man. So, how do these things apply to Revelation? All revelation is God bring us to Himself. All revelation is God come us to, to, to become friends with Him. We show us who He really is. You see, He's Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and Spirit. The incarnation, God the Man, Jesus Christ, this is the fullness of revelation. God comes to us with a human face, with a human heart, speaking to us in the words, and now we see who God is for. This is the end that God comes to us, reveals to us, not the book. Not with a speech, not with a prophet, but by his son, God comes down. The church is how we get revelation. It's what who, who has guarded and protected the scripture of the tradition, has it on to us, helps us see this, we can come to know God and be friends with him. And by revealing himself, God heals the wounds of the fall, forgives sin, makes us go to heaven, bring us to our perfect happiness. To know God is to be happy with Him. It's a revelation that coming to us, showing us who He is, and bringing us to friendship and happiness with Himself. Good. Question, Thomas? Let's close with prayer. Either I'm brilliant or you're all tired. <laughs> The answer which one? It's okay. <laughs> In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time and this conversation. Help us to understand more deeply who you are, what you've done for us. Help us to receive your truth, love in our hearts. And we love you fully as our God, our King, and our friend. We all that we say and you be for your glory. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, it is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. The Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.